opportunity isn't a chance, it is a choice. That is her credo, and it is her choices that have led her on a remarkable journey from the suburbs of America to the savannas of Africa. On this show, author and Feed the Children's Kenya Program Director, Robin Wizawadi. In her early 20s, Robin Wizawadi came to Kenya and discovered a life that was completely alien from her upbringing in middle America. So strong was her attachment to this new culture that she decided to stay in Africa and make it her home. The story of this incredible journey of self-discovery is beautifully told in her memoir, My Maasai Life, From Suburbia to Savannah. Robin, it's great to meet you. It's great to be here. It's great to meet you, too. It's, it's always uh, terrific when you read about somebody's life and then you get to meet them and ask the questions that you, know, you want to ask. Why don't we begin at the beginning? What were you like before? What were you like before this happened to you? I uh, was a regular kid. I was playing um, softball for 10 years on the local church softball league. I was swimming on my high school swim team and in student council, but uh, I would fight with my parents a lot, mm -hmm. a little bit too much. Were you angry? I was angry. Well, I was frustrated. And the frustration gave way to anger, and the anger gave way to really disrespectful. Really? Um, relationship that I had with my parents and I was actually uh, <laughs> in trouble a lot at school and would find myself in the principal's office sometimes instead of class and I was looking for something that I didn't know how to articulate and so I therefore found the wrong outlets for my anger and frustration. I mean I, it begins with with a diary entry, a journal entry of yours from November of 2001 and it's really quite moving and I mean I'll, although I don't want to you know read it all out right now I mean basically it's almost like you were expressing this frustration that you had that the reality that you were living in was not one of your choosing. Exactly. I wanted to see more than yeah. this, what had become the monotony. I mean, life is never monotony, but in my head, it had become this monotony of the life that I didn't choose, that other people chose for me. And yeah. I felt like I was being a little bit of a, of a cookie cutter in experience and wanted to break free of that. And it, it actually felt so dramatic that I wanted to break free and be sliced up and down of everything I've known to remold myself into well, the person that I could choose. And you were very driven. I mean, you know, taking 80, you know, the, the small jobs that you would have, I mean, you take, was it 80 percent and you would, you would put that away and all of your friends were going to malls and movies and music. And I knew I'd want something more than a movie ticket with the money. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so you, you were very aware that you were saving up for something big, but did you know that this would be it? I had no point? idea. No. I had no idea. Um, I remember when I was a little girl and people used to ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I never had an answer because mm. I never had heard of a career that I would want to be in, but I just knew that always for me there would be something else that I could go out there and define. What would have happened to you if you hadn't gone to Kenya? If you, if you, if you had not, you know, experienced Messiah culture? I have no idea. <laughs> I do you ever wonder about that? I, I do, and I don't know where to go with those thoughts, to tell you the truth. I think I would, uh, I don't know where I would be today. It would take a long time for that year. I would become more frustrated. Yeah. Um, more, I would feel more alone in the world. I would feel more misunderstood. I don't know what that would have led to, but definitely nothing productive. You, you wanted, you, you demanded that you have this sudden shock of, of culture and, and experience. And tell me what it was like. I mean, you, you write about it very powerfully in the book, but in your words now, I mean, take us there. I mean, what, you, you get off that plane. <laughs> um, well, I got off the plane with, with a backpack and uh, slowly... And you sold everything, right? Like you sold all your clothes. You oh, yeah, I put my clothes on my bed so my friends could come take what they wanted. The rest went to Goodwill. I gave my computer away and my printer and told my parents they could rent out my room. Not that a parent would ever do that, but I was just so... <laughs> intensely feeling like I was starting 100% over it. And by the time that I made it down to my new home of mud and cow dung and sticks, that I saw the jerry can that we would use to go collect the water carried on our backs, handled by this handmade rope and the firewood that we would balance and the bucket that I would bathe in and the fire we'd cook over. The time I saw all this, I loved it. Yeah. The more different it would be from my suburban my suburb outside Chicago. And the Chicago difficult the choices that you were confronted with, like, okay, after the cow salivates <laughs> in my bath water, do I still use it? And yeah. I'm, I'm reading going, I don't know if I would. <laughs> Did you? Did you use I it? I honestly don't even remember in that circumstance, but I have, I have bathed with you, many things <laughs> at this point. <laughs> you bathed a lot worse at this point. Yeah. What was, what was your first impression when you met the Messiah, when you met your family? They greeted me with uh, 
a reverence and a respect, a humility and a grandeur, an elegance and a joy that I felt at home immediately. I mean, Mama immediately uh, <laughs> sort of proved her personality as a joker by um, taking up this backpack. And I was so afraid that I'd brought too much. And, and she like puts it on as though it's so heavy. And I was like, oh God, this is awful. I'm embarrassing myself. And then she laughed at me and swung it over her shoulder and off she went. But She got you. Exactly. Yeah, she totally That's got me. That's a great <laughs> moment in the book, you know, because it, it, it just the fact that she was that playful with you. Mm -hmm. What were some of the first things that she taught you immediately? Hmm. She taught me how women act in the household. I found that the, one of the most inter interesting parts of your story. Mm -hmm. I remember when my baba, or my father of the family, first walked into uh, the kitchen that mm -hmm. we would be in. And, and me and mama and my brothers and sisters were all sitting there and we were talking and making fun of each other, asking what's gonna happen at school today, drinking a breakfast of tea. And my baba walks in the door and everyone became silent. Yeah. Not out of fear, but out of respect. And they all got up one by one and went over and bent their head down for him to touch in an individual greeting. And everyone kind of had this like giddiness. Is he gonna talk to me? Is he gonna ask me about school? What should I say? But I learned that it's not always what I, you, the gender dynamic between men and women. Yes, there is a lot of inequality there in terms mm -hmm. of how the household chores and everything is managed, but there's also an element of respect. And it's important to see both sides to know when you, when you want to make a change or you want to introduce a new way of working with different genders, it's important to know where they've come from to begin with. But there was, I mean, you, you, I know you emulated the way Mama and Faith acted and, and, and you know, kind of use them as a model in, in terms of what to do because you, you couldn't be overly exuberant. That could be misinterpreted, correct? Exactly. Tell me more about that. Uh, I am outgoing. Yeah. <laughs> I tend to talk a lot. I smile, I laugh a lot. Uh, but that can be a little bit misconstrued. You, um, it can be seen as that you're, you're a, a little bit too open towards men in particular. Promiscuous? And, exactly, and yeah. I didn't want to portray that in myself. I never felt as though I'd lost any part of my personality by becoming more passive, but I did you feel You just answered my next question. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I was accessing new parts of myself. We don't need to be the same personality all throughout life, and this, this situation created uh, an arena for me to try new parts of a personality. This is a role. It was just a, it's, a, it's a skin you wear. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, did it, how did it make you think, once, you know, when, and when you come back to, to North America when you, or Western culture, does that, does it, do you co go back into another role or, 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 you know, what in terms of gender dynamics, what do you take with you? I take the idea of respect for everyone honor yeah. for everyone's work and contributions in whatever roles those could be. I enjoy uh, being a little bit more outgoing here, but I enjoy being more thoughtful and reflective there. When the Oregon Files returns, Raba Wuzawadi reveals her true feelings about her birth parents. You refer to your parents, uh, your birth parents, as your Western parents now. I find that really interesting. Yeah, I'm, my the role that my mom, my Chicago mom, my my Western mom, yeah. plays in my life will never ever be replaced. So she gave birth to me, she raised me, as did my dad. Like I love them, and that is a relationship that will never be replicated. Yeah. I also feel a really tender closeness with my Maasai mama and baba, and they play protective parental roles that I also respect in my Were life. you particularly lucky to find the family that you ended up with, or I mean, is that indicative of the culture itself? I would absolutely say that I'm lucky and that it is indicative of the culture. Right. I, that they are exceptional mm, in an exceptional people. Absolutely. I could have gone to any family, and, and I did. I would sometimes spend the night over at this house and sometimes the night over at that house, and yeah. people would remind me when I hadn't been spending the night at their house recently. But So the community really comes together to raise everyone, but I do feel so connected to my Maasai family. How would you characterize the Maasai culture? Um, well, I think the Maasai culture is <clears throat> beautiful and elegant and changing and evolving. A lot of the traditions that they've had for years and years are no longer applicable in today's world. With the increased landlessness and encroachment of development and surrounding ideas of westernization, Maasai, who never before had seen a Coke bottle, now drink Coke every market day. Yeah. And sometimes they wear their traditional clothes and sometimes they wear their western clothes. And because they're more permanent now, their homes of mud and cow dung and stick are changing. They're being built up to 
cement floors and wooden walls and tin roofs such as the house that I once lived in is now replaced with this new modern house. So when you see that, how does that make you feel? I mean, are you, are you sad when you see that? or did, What emotions do you, do you go through when you see them drinking Coke out of a bottle? Um, I let their responses give me an indication as to how I should respond because I don't know that I have too much of a, of a place to put an opinion on their culture. I can make mm -hmm. opinions about my own life, but theirs is theirs. And they take the things that they want. They they, don't they're able to the cherry pick. That they don't. Exactly. And the elders wouldn't necessarily cherry pick the same things that the young ones are choosing. Yeah. But uh, it's very interesting to see the path that the culture is moving toward. Well, they're like so many indigenous cultures uh, around the world trying to find that that line, that fine line between maintaining your culture and your traditions in a, in a world that doesn't always respect them and sometimes envelops them. Yeah, and if anyone wants to see Maasai as, as they traditionally are, this is really the last generation to be able to do so. In the you next think? 10 or 20 years, it will look much different. What will happen? Houses will be built up. The kids will be educated. They'll be able to maintain the cultural values of, of respect and dignity and protectiveness but then other cultures might end up changing. Like they might not have huge herds of cattle anymore, yeah. but they'll have a bank account that they can run a business from, a currency that's more applicable in today's world. So some things will look the same, but some things, the physical things, will begin to look a little bit different. Uh, when you take Samuel to Nairobi for the first time, it's a, it's a great episode in the book. Uh, and, and when Wilson and Jackson, who are with Free the Children and, and, and our Masai, when I dealt with them the other day, on, you know, I, I just, I couldn't believe it. This is the first time out of their village. This is the first time on a plane. And I met them at an 80s themed party, you know, with, <laughs> I mean, as they, I mean, their MC <laughs> Hammer pants that somebody had gotten them. And they're just really? like, what, what is going on? And I'm, I'm trying to explain that we're at an 80s party and we're wearing them, you know, we, we, we did wear them. They were fashionable. Now we don't wear them, but we're mocking them and we're having fun with it. And they're looking at me like, boy, you people are strange. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, yeah, we really, we really are, you know? But they are in such a state of flux at the moment, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're exposed to this, and you have to ask yourself, well, how does that change the mindset when they go back? I remember when Samuel had first come to Nairobi, just like Wilson and Jackson now in Canada, and his mind was blown because he had never, well, even on a very basic level, he had never heard so much noise at one time before. Yeah, you take him to the movie. Oh, the movie theater. He didn't last three minutes. No, he was so overstimulated that after like making my arm black and blue from squeezing, we had to get up and leave. Just sen sensory overload. Mm -hmm. What was interesting though is when Samuel and I had a conversation after we got back to the village about his experience in Nairobi, the biggest difference that he identified from yeah. his culture and our culture had nothing to do with the resources or the entertainment. It had everything to do with how people treat one another. And he was so surprised that you could walk down a busy city street and someone could brush up against your shoulder, not apologize, not even say hi, and that no one within the entire vicinity of all these crowded people would say hi to anyone, which is very different from in the village where you see someone at a distance. And you're going this way and they're going that way, but you stop, you come, you say hi to each other, you hear if any news that you bring me, any news that you can share with them, yeah. and then you go on your ways again. You talk about um, uh, you know the poverty. I mean, obviously you see, you see poverty in, a, in almost a physical sense, in a tangible sense. But you also look at, at Western culture and realize the emotional poverty that many of us suffer from, mm -hmm. the isolation, the lack of cohesion. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how in a world that we feel as though we have most things to meet our physical needs, we still want more. Yeah. You know, we think of a level of poverty as absolute poverty, that you, you don't have a roof to put over your head, food to eat, a school to go to, health care if you need it. And then there's the poverty that you would call yourself impoverished if you don't have something that you never thought you wanted until you heard about it. Like, I don't have the latest iPod or I don't have this. And there's this feeling of lack of what you are owed from the society, which can bring us down to a state of depression. Whereas in Kenya, most people are joyful and they walk around happy and you never question how genuine someone is. And I think that there's so much that the two cultures can learn from one another. We can have a society where we can meet our physical needs and have a, a full emotional heart at the same time. How do we do that? I think it begins with individual actions. Us taking responsibility for our own interactions with my mom. I mean, after living with the Maasai for a long time, I had to say, learning the value of family with, with the Maasai family, I had to say, do I have the kind of relationship with my mom that I want to? Mm -hmm. Do I treat my dad with respect that he deserves? How do I talk to him? And it started within my family. And every day looking for ways to 
try to create a world that we're proud of, recognizing that we all have our own stamp and footprint that we put in it. It's not easy, and I make mistakes all the time, but I try, just like we all can. When the O'Regan Files returns, Robin Wuzawadi shares her thoughts on the Maasai tradition of female circumcision. Back to your parents again. I think the most moving part of the book for me was when they came to visit you. It's been one of the most moving parts of my life. So when my parents came to visit me. That must have been so emotional. Absolutely. And thank you for asking about my parents. I love getting the chance to honor them in any way possible, and I love talking about them. I had been begging my mom and dad for about six years to come and visit me, pleading with them to come and meet my Maasai family, see my career with Free the Children, see what makes me feel so alive. And they finally agreed to come. And it was rather last minute, too. And they had to get boarding, they had to, not boarding, they had to get passports. They had to get, yeah. My to, mom yeah. and dad have never had a passport, but they do now, proudly stamped with a yeah. Kenyan visa. But um, they came and it was one of the most beautiful things for my Maasai mama and my mom to embrace each other. Oh my gosh. I know, and my baba and my dad, it was wonderful. It happened to overlap with my Maasai brother's circumcision ceremony, which basically meant that my Maasai family was having a huge house party anyways, and the whole community came over. Dad interacting with the elders, mom on her knees, like mm, peeling potatoes with all of the women. Right. And it was such a beautiful bridge of the two worlds coming together. And your dad said that you, you were now a giant in his eyes. That must have just been so overwhelming. All throughout my life, my dad has encouraged my sister Erin and my brother Adam and I to think big. He would leave self-help books on the kitchen table saying, Erin, Robin, Adam, read chapter three. We're going to talk about it at dinner. All of our life he's tried to help us grow into people with big thoughts. And when he called me, he didn't even call me big, he called me a giant. It will remain with me forever. Yeah, and you look back, and the ad, you know, you mentioned in the book how you'd go to school with your sister and you'd recite these, you know, <laughs> self-help mottos or whatever, kind of in a in a in a deprecating way, but but it, it suddenly it, it resonated. Mm -hmm. Suddenly it all made sense. And while my dad, while he was teaching us, and we'd have to say aloud, "I'm fearless, I'm determined, yeah. I'm powerful, I'm unstoppable." While we'd have to say that, he never thought I would, as a child, he never thought I would take it in the direction of going to Kenya. But and it, while it was a shock in the beginning for me to tell my parents what I wanted to do, now they, especially after having come, yeah. are very happy and proud of the person I've turned into. What about you know, if you have kids, and they choose movies and malls and music? Would that disappoint you? I don't know. That's a fair answer. Yeah. I hope one day I'm blessed enough to be a mom. It will probably be some of the hardest mom moments I'll ever have in my life for my child to choose something different than I'd want for them. But my parents did it. Mm -hmm. And I think I turned out okay. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And I have to trust my children. Although again, I don't know how hard this will be when the moment comes, but I will trust in my children to choose the best path for them. As a woman, how, did you, how do you grapple and how do you cope with your, you know, an obvious respect that you have for the Maasai culture and the Maasai tradition? And then on the other hand, to, you know, to be part of something that here in the West we consider so barbaric is female circumcision. I mean, you know, we obviously place judgment on this and you were caught as, you know, as an educated, progressive Western woman in their culture, being respectful of their culture, and I guess struggling still to, to deal oh, with human yes. rights issues I, in an objective way. Yes, my, well when my mama first approached me and asked me, Nasirian, my masa name, what they'd call me, do you want to um, come and support this girl who's getting circumcised? I didn't quite know what female circumcision was, and I didn't know what it means to support someone, and she was asking me with so much excitement that I kind of said, okay. Yeah. But I didn't know that meant to witness it, and I didn't know that meant to be a part of this weekend-long ceremony. Talking with elders and young people and educated and uneducated people about why they practice the tradition, and again, come, starting with where they've come from, they've taught me that to end this practice, a zero-tolerance policy won't change anything, but that it begins with understanding where they've come from. Mm -hmm. introducing them to the health implications of such a decision 
and then slowly, together, we can continue to learn about what the right choice for the daughters are. And the educated Maasai are, are changing. Um, traditional elders are, against, are for the practice. The younger generation is against the practice because of what they've learned of the health implications in school. And so my role in this is to ensure that, those, that education is there so that they can decide how they want to take their culture. Um, and I can do my part in a respectful way. It must be marvelous that you find yourself now in a position where you know the work that you do is so close to your passion, to your heart, uh, and and that you you know you can you can put into practice things that you've believed and still believe. I feel so honored to be working with Free the Children as the Kenya program director, working with Maasai communities to help the elders achieve their vision for the community. And when you sit down with these elders mm -hmm. underneath these trees, the meeting points, and you ask them what it is that they want for their grandchildren, their children in their community, they always say the same thing. They always say education. Yeah. And working with them with education and clean water programs and healthcare and alternative income program, we're actually just getting ready to launch our newest alternative income program called Midui Artisans, that Maasai women are able to take their cultural practice of beadwork and put a North American fashion twist on it to broaden the market and ensure that they can educate their kids. And my Maasai mama is leading up all of the different trainings. We have 160 women from oh, my terrific. community involved in, and engaged within Midui Artisans. And we are, to me, this, this comes full circle to have my Chicago parents have participated in this to bring the development work back to the community that has taught me so much. It's a dream come true. What, I mean, what message would you leave with Canadians who are watching now I mean, what, in, in terms of the challenges that the Kenya and Africa faces? Because sometimes it just seems so insurmountable mm -hmm. uh, and, and almost hopeless. Uh, and and, and that, you know, the fact that this is, you know, or, or, or chronic in our eyes. What, what message would you leave? with people who feel that way? I would say, you're right. It is a little bit, um, you look for the inspiration, and the inspiration comes every day. It's the small actions that we can take. Not far away, I mean, go far away, come to Kenya and help us build schools, but also start with our moms and dads in our home. Start in our schools through having different Free the Children campaigns within our groups of friends and engage in our community, and step by step, we each can do our part in the creation of this world that we are proud of to live in. It's so great to meet you. Same to you. Thank you, Rob. Marvelous.